Hi everyone um, and welcome to the Building Healing Communities online event. I'm hoping that you're able to hear me and if you're not please just let me know in the chat so I can adjust some settings. Um, I've received a few emails this morning about and calls this morning about people not being able to get into the meeting just a couple of time zone issues so if you were one of those people you weren't alone that was a large problem for a lot of people so I'm sorry about the confusion with that. Um, but thank you all for joining the meeting just a little bit earlier so that we could start right on time. Um, I'd just quickly like to run through the format of today's session and some of the Zoom features that we're going to be using so that you're all understanding of what's going on. Um, first of all, I just want you to know that this event is being recorded. You can probably see that in the top corner of your screen. Um, so if you don't want your face to be part of the recording, then just switch off your camera. That's no worries. Um, your microphone should should have been muted when you entered. Um, that wasn't the case for some people. So um, if you aren't muted, please pop your microphone on mute um, just to minimize sound um, during the presentations. Um, but if you've signed up for a deep dive at the end of the session, uh, that will not be recorded. So feel free to turn on your videos, turn on your microphones during that time um, because you know, you're free to participate without worry about it being recorded and, and distributed or any of that. Um, if you haven't yet opted in for a deep dive session and you would like to, it's just a half hour window um, starting at 12 o'clock, again, ending at um, 12.30 Adelaide time, um, where you can just have a deeper discussion about the things that we talked about today, um, a facilitated discussion, putting ideas and actions forward towards an action plan. Um, and the, the areas of focus that children and family centres childcare and early learning, play groups, school communities, and also faith communities. So hop into your emails if you want to join one of those. There will be a link to a form that you can fill out. It's not too late to put your name down for one. Um, but also just letting you know if you've signed in using a different email than um, you registered with, or if you have a different name displayed right now, we won't know who you are to actually put you in that deep dive group. So you can rename yourself by clicking um, the three dots at the top of your video screen. You can rename yourself to make sure that we have your name correct. We can put you in the right deep dive session. Um, great. And the final thing is that we will be using the chat function today. I can see that some people already have been doing that. Um, the chat is being monitored. So any questions that you have for presenters, any comments that you would like to make, you're very welcome to do that in the chat. Um, and uh, they'll, they'll be presented during the Q&A session. And I've just, I can just see a question popping up saying, will we be able to access the recording after the session? Yes, the recording of the event will be available um, and I'll make sure that um, everyone who has registered receives a link to where that is in case they want to share it or rewatch anything that will be made available. Excellent. So thank you for listening to all of that information. Um, I'm going to hand over to Robert Taylor now to kick us off. So Robert, if you can unmute your microphone and you can start us today, thank you. How's that? Well, I've had a bit of uh, a good training into this Zoom sort of stuff <laughs> last bit of time, but anyway, um, uh, without further ado, um, as, a, as a Natanjali Corny, a Natanjali man, I would like to acknowledge that uh, we are having this symposium together on the traditional lands of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains. We recognize and respect their cultural heritage and, and relationship with, with the land. We respect also the elders um, who, who had gone on before and, and to this present day. We'd also acknowledge uh, other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today amongst the, uh, the audience and thank you all for being involved in this symposium. <coughs> now, um, I've been asked to say a word. Um, I, I approach things a bit differently and, and <laughs> many, like many of you have had to sort of like bring stuff down into five minutes or 10 minutes or so. But anyway, here we go. Our house. It has a number of items that are involved in its being a good place to inhabit. One of those things is the old water tap. Now it has a function to allow water to come and, and to, to give our, our overall well-being. Sometimes it suffers wear and tear, the damage, and then it needs fixing. Because when I first, first left high school, I, I had a job with the local plumber. So I learned how to fix these sort of things. So I had to check it out, find out the problem, um, put in a new, a new washer and, and then give it a grind or, and, and then put it back. If there's some major happening in the house, I call on a relevant person to fix that, that problem. 
Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have suffered trauma at various kinds. So what we'd expect is people with relevant knowledge of that, that issue um, to be of assistance. Or maybe others um, brought in uh, that have that knowledge. Or, or if you're it, then gain the knowledge of how to manage and, and heal the, the situation. But in the case of people, we, we involve a relevant community, whether um, peer support or, or, or local um, identities. Now, I don't profess to know what, a, what it feels like to have suffered trauma to the extent that many of my countrymen and women and children have had. But I have had my issues in life, you know. I was born to an Aboriginal woman who, who worked as a domestic on a, on a rural property in 1954. I never knew my Aboriginal father and I still don't know till this day. I had an, Eng an English stepfather uh, from the age of four till about I was 12 years of age. He left my mother at that time and he was rough on her and, and, he, and, he, 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 um, and he used physical violence on, on me all through my early years. I left school early, um, started smoking in the drugs and started crime and ended up in prison in Perth and Brisbane. Um, but I come clear in my mid-twenties and I went to a theological college, I, I, got, I got married, I had three children. After 22 years of marriage, it failed, it, it, it fell through. I'm, I'm um, separated now for 10 years and my three adult children live here with me. The Salvation Army were looking for someone to fill a role nine years ago. I'm still here. It's been a healing place for me and a place of preparation for the next phase in my life of, of working in, in society uh, and to help those who need it. It's true that there are many people in Australia, um, uh, Aussies and people in general who suffer trauma of some kind. Um, so what is vitally Im important is, is the acknowledging awareness of, the, of what has taken place to cause that trauma. It's then up to the, the responder at the, at the scene to assist, call in relevant assistance uh, if required. Depending on the trauma incident, it, it would be expected that appropriate um, awareness of support be brought forward. As for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander situation, it's, it's really imperative that uh, an acknowledging awareness of the trauma suffered be had and appropriate steps should be taken to, to seek out a, a, and provide appropriate support needed for the healing process to take place. Now, whether that support is peer support workers, cultural awareness training, there's a, there's a whole lot of stuff out there, education of the Australian uh, history, the true history or whatever, you know. Um, but it's about, um, it's about relevant support, truth telling, um, forgiveness, a whole, a whole range of stuff. Now, in a minute, you're going to watch a short rap uh, on being a dad. Uh, it's, it's, it's about us changing the paradigm, uh, our way of thinking, yes. We've experienced trauma, but let's acknowledge it. Let's get it out through counselling or journaling and, 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 and um, uh, you know, being, a, being of a forgiving nature, which in itself uh, is, is healing. And let us be there for our children. So thank you, Sarah, and thank you all for being a part of this in, in symposium and enjoy the day. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. We'll, we'll just watch um, a, a short video now um, of a familiar face. So I'll just share my screen and, and get that going for us. When I was a boy and things were not so good, that man treated me rough and not the way he should. So now in my heart it's plain to understand the way that I've turned now, now that I'm a man. So what we need to do is have a little talk about the way we feel and what we're going to do to get on top of the problems we face and to have a better life and share the family space. It's not hard to give and take, to share our own piece of cake, think about all our wishes, thoughts and ideas while doing the dishes. Then the success or bust while we try so hard to make a crust, provide for the family, put food 
depend on themselves, but then don't forget to look after ourselves. They say to raise a child takes a village. Be instructive, not wild. Don't destroy, pull down or pillage. Our children need all our love and not so much our own push and shoving. While all these words are starting to flow, it's simply talking about the way we should go. It may have been hard and not so easy. We shouldn't make it narrow and not so squeezy. Give our children some sound advice. Don't come down on them like a bag of ice. They need all their help and support, not neglect to the point where they end up in court. So can we agree as we share this space that our children need all our mercy and grace? The future's not ours, it's really theirs. We need to step up and be the one who cares. Thanks, Robert. Thanks for sharing that. Thanks for sharing some of your story. And thanks for that dad's rap, which, by the way, um, was a world premiere. Um, so we released it on YouTube right at this minute, so you'll be able to access it on YouTube if you like. Welcome, everybody. Um, it's fantastic to have you on board. There's about 300 of you, and you come from uh, government, non-government organisations who are focused on child working with children and families. And you're from all across Australia, every state and territory. And it's a great opportunity to, for us to come together and work out what we can do better for families and children. My name is Carl Brennick. I'm the manager of Salisbury Communities for Children. Um, and this event is looking a little bit different from what it initially was planned to be. We initially planned to meet a few of us locally up the road in a community centre. Um, but because of COVID, it's created some different opportunities and it's turned out a little bit different. Um, one of the things about this event is there's a lot more homework than initially we had uh, intended. So I don't know whether any of you have done that, but uh, we're not going to unfortunately be able to check up on your homework, but there's lots of pre-reading and lots of uh, opportunities to share, um, listen to videos and other things that are available. Um, in speaking in terms of encouragement, um, we, we were encouraged recently, we want to have a Twitter conversation of this as well, if you want to please use the hashtag um, building healing communities because we can encourage each other on Twitter and we can share with each other and continue to keep the conversation going between the three sessions over the next three weeks. Lester Rigney tweeted the other day in relation to COVID, uh, native people would never sacrifice their elders for the good of the community. And some of us thought that was encouraging. <laughs> and um, we're privileged to have some elders with us today and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from them. Um, I've been very interested in a book called Common Purpose, which I've been reading recently by social analyst Elizabeth B. Shaw from, uh, from the US. And she talks about the initiatives of Head Start in the 80s and 90s and what's developed from them and what's come of them. And it's great that you can look back and see the challenges around attempts to transform communities um, through developing issues as broadly as housing down to family centres and community support and support in the early years. And um, one of the things that she says is that there have been few attempts to learn systematically from current experience and disseminate that learning to those responsible for community change initiatives, to those who make relevant policy in the private and public sector and to the general public. We're trying to share in this time together what we've learnt and look at how we can actually improve on what we're doing in communities in a way that's sustainable. Brian Babington, the Chief Executive of Families Australia, said at the National Early Years Summit, uh, which we had in Melbourne in March this year, he said, we're dripping with data that tells us that we're heading in the wrong direction. We need to become more visionary and bold. And at that same event, um, we had Richard Weston speak, and he spoke of different community knowledge systems. He said, um, as well as Western evidence, we need community knowledge systems and trauma aware healing informed approach. We need to consider other worldviews. Science is helpful, um, but it won't solve every problem. And data is helpful, but it won't solve every problem. Some believe that and all the best to them, but hopefully it'll come up with a vaccine for COVID-19 and that, that looks promising. But it's unlikely to resolve all the issues contributing to an issue like, for instance, intergenerational trauma. So we need community knowledge systems as well as data and science. Clyde Rigney from the Raukin community, which was one of the bits of pre-listening which you hopefully did, 
um, said that he's the secretary, of, uh, um, he's the CE of the Secretary of National Aboriginal and Islander Childcare. He said this recently speaking at, at AFES um, on, a, on a, an online event. He said, as well as Western evidence, we need community knowledge systems and trauma-aware healing-informed approach. Clyde Rigney, that was what Richard said. Now, Clyde said uh, in an interview with Dana Shen recently, uh, talking about the Raupin community, he said, you're not just dealing with one person, you're dealing with a whole community. In our Western approach, we've tended to be clinical and we tend to think in terms of individuals. We can learn from the First Nations people that we're dealing with whole communities and we're dealing with whole families. And Richard also said at that National Early Years Summit, the sacred place is where we get better outcomes for children. And uh, Alison Wunungmara, a family educator and teacher from Northeastern Arnhem Land, uh, said at that same Early Years uh, Summit, the, she defined the sacred places. That's where we accept and share our frustrations and cheer our champions for young kids. We need places where people can open up and share. And that's what we need to work out how we can um, include that in all of our early years support um, communities that, that we have. There's a, currently a lot of debate going around the reforming of the childcare system. And in a recent interview, Joe Weatherall um, at that same Australian Institute of Family Studies um, online event said, whatever we need to do needs to be quality it needs to be universal and it needs to be integrated. Now he acknowledged the challenge of integrating the services with three levels of government, non-government organisations and all the community interest groups. That's the challenge, that's the challenge that we face and part of what we're trying to do here is look at how we can actually better integrate that, how we can integrate family support, for instance, with education for young children. And we need to listen to the voices of children. Um, former um, commissioner, children's commissioner, Megan, Megan Mitchell, um, did a lot of listening to children. And I guess the key things that she heard from children as she traveled around the country was that children feel like they need to be safe, they need to be cared for, and they need a healthy environment. And there was a tweet, Snake tweeted yesterday, a young boy um, saying, a young First Nations boy saying, we are the elders of tomorrow, hear our voice. We need to listen to those voices. So during the next three weeks, um, we want to come up with a, an action plan for local communities to better support families in the early years. And we've engaged Nova Smart Solutions to put together a report which will go to governments, non-government organisations and communities. We want you to think about the needs and strengths of families in your community. So we want each of you to put together too um, some kind of an action plan as to what you can do, what each of you can contribute in your local community in whichever discipline, whichever sector that you're working in. And the questions we want, to think, want you to think about are about the needs and strengths of families in your community. Who are the families in our community and what do they need from us in order to feel a sense of safety and belonging? How do we build a culture which feels inclusive to them? What are the enablers and challenges of making positive changes to build safety and belonging in a helping and inclusive service? What resources do we need and where can we source these technical, financial, social, skilled input, leadership, governance, collaboration, education and care materials? They're the questions we want to think about, particularly in relation to three critical windows of opportunity, um, remembering that we need both evidence base and an understanding of community knowledge systems. So the first thousand days, perinatal support, home visiting, children and family centres, what can we do in the first thousand days? We've found the model of family centres as well as children's centres. In South Australia, we have highly invested in children's centres and through Communities for Children, we've discovered that family centres can add something to that, dealing with more crisis type situations and traumatised families. They offer a range of different programs, including supported playgroups, literacy groups, parenting groups, attachment support, home visiting, cultural support groups, and support for fathers, including dads, playgroups, etc. They provide a friendly, welcoming environment where the whole community feels welcome to take part in activities and where cultures are respected. Everyone is welcome and people just need to turn up. Um, Associate Professor Elspeth McGuinness and Kathleen Wilson will talk, be talking about that in more detail next week. 
in the second thousand days, what can we do in the second thousand days, which is, you know, three and about six, um, in terms of childcare, early learning centres, playgroups, kindergartens, how can we build better integrated family support into these critical environments? Um, Associate Professor Victoria Whiting, oh, sorry, um, Dr. Jenny Stanley, good start, and Craig Bradbrook from Playgroups SA will be talking about that in coming weeks and also leading deep dives into those areas in about uh, half an hour. Uh, and the third thousand days, junior primary school, faith community, social media, how can we build trauma informed um, social emotional learning into junior primary curricula? Associate Professor Victoria Waddington, James Lenigas will be talking about that. Um, it's not just about services, it's about communities. We need communities. We need communities where there is support for traumatized people as well as individual um, therapy. Um, faith communities need to be included in the conversation because they can build community capacity and because community knowledge systems, beliefs and spiritual development are important. Dr. Glenn Cupid, who's researched in this area, um, will be talking and taking a deep dive on that area too, if you want to join that group. So, and also online communities need to be included given the benefits and challenges of social media and the coming artificial intelligence dominated world. Dr. Leslie I will be speaking about that um, in two weeks time. So one of the key uh, findings of the South Australian Service System Code design was that as well as trauma informed practice, we need trauma responsive practice. So what does a trauma responsive healing community look like? That's one of the big challenges we looked at and we've searched really uh, a lot in this area and there's been a lot of fantastic work done, but I think none better than by um, Professor Judy Atkinson, um, who's just done some amazing work with First Nations people in this area. And um, I see Judy, you are there um, with us. <laughs> we have been having a, a fascinating time trying to download technology. She was going to try to uh, she actually recorded a 10 minute pre-recorded video, uh, video because she is, she is so busy and so in demand at the moment with all the crisis going on around the country, you, you would be aware of that. But um, it's fantastic to see you there, Judy. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to, to her in a minute. She probably really doesn't need any introduction, um, but she's, she's a, a Jima in central west Queensland, um, Bunjilong, northern New South Wales woman with Anglo-Celtic and German heritage. So she understands culture and cultural differences. Um, she's received a number of awards for her work and was made a member of the Order of Australia in 2019. She's been pivotal in developing an, an educaring trauma-informed approach to healing generational trauma for Aboriginal Australians. And she's currently in extremely high demand. She joins us to introduce the theme of building trauma-informed communities. So Judy, that's fantastic that you're with us uh, live and uh, welcome. <laughs> I'm not very good at technology, and yesterday I, we had a big meeting here about some children. I'm in Moree at the moment, and I was stressed out of my mind all night until I got a message that I could get online now. So I just want to thank everybody for allowing that to happen. Can you all hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Oh, so thank you very much. I want to start by quoting something, um, and then we'll talk. Now, I'm, in, uh, the, I'm here in Moree on the land of the Gamari people, Gamari people. Um, and I'm actually in a school, uh, and I'll be here for six months, working with children and their families uh, who have been expelled or suspended from every other school. So I'm right where we need to have a deep think about things. I guess in this country here at the moment, uh, the country out Western New South Wales, we're starting to reflect very deeply uh, about what has happened over the history of this place and what now is changing rapidly. Just down the road from here is the Mile Creek Massacre site. Uh, but what is happening in this place right now is the importation of very heavy drugs and children are involved in a whole lot of uh, activities within their families that are very harmful. So I just want to quote something that I put into a paper a while ago, Aboriginal people as individuals and within their families and communities have been profoundly heard across generations by layered historic, social, cultural and complex trauma. And you're absolutely right, we don't have the services that we need. Where there is hurt, there has to be a healing. 
And it's not just the healing, it's now the truth telling that we, we need to in, involve ourselves in as well. And in that, the storyteller becomes the teacher and the listener becomes the student. And I think that's an important point we make. As we listen, we learn. Um, behind me here, I'm sitting and I've been running, um, doing some work with Prime Minister and Cabinet um, on some getting some programs into place on domestic and family violence. Um, is a on the wall, I don't know if you can see it, but these are all of the female elders who have passed here in Gumilaroi country. Um, and, and so we're very much aware of the incredible strength that those women have brought to what has been the recovery process for people here. And we just had a little conversation here before I got online with uh, some of the women saying, now our men have to stand up and start to move forward and that's just absolutely fabulous. But let's just talk for a while about how that could happen. Um, I guess a lot of you have heard the words Didiri or Didiri uh, from uh, Miriam Rose Angamal Borman, Daly River um, in the Northern Territory. And it was the Aboriginal gift to the nation. How do we truly listen to each other when there is such pain on both sides of the frontier? Uh, in this town, there's extreme wealth. It's one of the most wealthy regions in Australia for agriculture. And I've just been driving through the, uh, the missions, the five missions here, and extreme poverty. But it's interesting to me that the drugs come into the places where the pain is, the extreme poverty. So we've been considering how we work with kids who are in a lot of pain, a lot of distress. I, um, I feel very blessed to be able to be here um, and, and I was invited to come out and work from the school. So I have a, a culture room. And just before I got online, I asked people if they would like to come to the culture room. And we're going to start very small as we work outwards to involve the community in what we call both a truth telling and a whole of community mapping for communities of care within uh, what we would talk about the communities of practice. The communities of practice have been failing. They don't know how to respond to the extreme tra trauma in this town. It's well beyond a trauma-informed approach. Um, it's uh, much, much deeper than, uh, and the, the, the pain in the children is immense. Um, I'm just, because this is public, we have just had 10 arrests here of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal men on child sexual assault. We've just had 11 arrests on serious drug taking. And the children, are the ones that live through that in a community. So what would the model that we have from We Are Lee, we is fire and Ali is water in Wapaburra language, uh, what would the model that we have, have that allows us to start to think about how we can start to work really solidly in healing trauma? Well, first of all, we have to create culturally safe places. And those culturally safe places have to be places where people can share some of the innermost parts of their being, the shameful and painful things that nobody wants to talk about. For years, we've looked at uh, the, the, the frontier violence, we've looked at other things that have happened, um, and we've looked at domestic violence, sexual assault. I did a lot of work in that back in, in the early 1990s out of Canberra. But what we've now come to understand is the word sexual violence is also now a part of our vocabulary. And when I first came to this school, um, when I was first invited to come out here, we coined um, some language. The first bit of the language was symptom is history, as we worked with the grandmothers and the mothers. But the children's behavior was telling us, their behavior was the language that was telling us what they were living with. So we said that we had to start to create so culturally safe environments where we were. Um, and I had a meeting here yesterday with a, a, a group of people who want to start to do some deep healing work as we find and tell those stories, the parts of the things that we have pushed aside that's fractured. And how do we make sense of those stories when in fact, within the community, we, we've covered them over. We don't want to talk about them. It's too painful and shameful. This is the products of colonization. And what we've found is the children, are the barometers, they act out the pain on the streets. Now that's not all children, but this is the school I'm working in. And just before I came on, I had a meeting with the district um, superintendent for education here. And we all agree, health, facts, that's child protection, education, have a lacking the skills to work with children in really deep distress. So the feelings are acted out by the children. 
So then we start to move through layers of loss and grief to an ownership to the choices that we can make as children, as adults, and we strengthen our cultural and spiritual identities. One of the first things I did is I engaged with a young fella. Um, his father has just been taken away um, and he'll serve a, quite a long sentence. And I said to this young fella, tell me one animal that you really would like to talk to me about and his chosen horse. So we're in the process of working with children to um, put together a package of cards and the children's stories around the animals they've chosen. What we've had to do here is to create a, a place of safety for the children. And when I say children, um, we're, we're working with uh, high school children now. We've worked with uh, the children in primary school. So the, the children are, are 10 and over. And, and so their lives are, are, are incredibly damaged um, at different levels, really painful um, as you sit with them. But they have um, some stories and a strength in them, a resilience in them that actually gets them into more strife, their, their capacity. So we create a calming, the safety that's here, and we start to bring ourselves together, a, a self and collective epistasy. Yes, we can do this together, working with them and a connectedness. And our language is a language of hope. How do we create hope? So um, part of that is uh, asking them to tell us their stories. And sometimes my heart stops for a while as I listen to the stories the children have to share. They're really painful stories. I wanted to um, bring into that, that uh, sometimes the streets are unsafe. Sometimes the homes are unsafe when you're working and living within a community that's in crisis, when the drugs are here and the drugs have become an industry. Um, and so we choose to work with the police and the police have been brilliant. Uh, they open up the PCYC here on Friday night when we know the drugs are gonna hit town um, and on all day Saturday and they provide food so the children have something to eat. Um, my model, however, is this. First of all, start small. In this room I'm sitting in now, and I invite the parents, the carers to come in, and we start to map together a community of care. How do we develop a community of care amongst us? And then we start to work out further to the service providers who generally do not have a trauma-informed approach or a trauma-specific approach, a trauma relevant approach, all of the different words we can use, they do not have um, the skills or the theory base to understand that the children's behavior is the language that's telling us this great trauma embedded in this place. So working with them, we're intent on developing a community of practice. And so one of the things I'll be doing in the next six months is a lot of walking, um, talk to the mayor. We've had a talk to her. She said this whole community needs healing the whole community, the rich graziers, uh, the, the business people, the white fellas, as well as our own mob. So everybody, she said to me here, everybody needs healing here. And I thought, wow, what an opportunity. Go to the state government, go to the federal government, more particularly sit in groups with uh, women, grandmothers who are looking after six or seven grandchildren because the grandmothers have got it together while the drugs are hitting the, the families. Um, and sitting with the men, uh, talking to the young men. I was inspired by the young men and they uh, talked to me about what they think they can do to start to uh, make the, the, the streets safe here. What I've done today is um, say to you that in some parts of Australia, it's not good. Um, when I was a young girl, I can remember at 14 years of age, I'm 77 now, and I can remember um, just leaving school and a group of us were talking and we heard that one of our schoolmates had gone to a party and she'd smoked marijuana and we thought that was like the biggest thing you could possibly do wrong. Um, well, now the drugs that are hitting our communities are beyond my comprehension and they're doing incredible damage. And I can give you the names of places and people where the drugs are being deliberately bought in as a commodity to make money by certain groups of people. And the damage I'm seeing is massive. And the bottom line is the children are hurting. They're living, uh, sometimes without food to eat. So at school, we're teaching kids to cook as part of the curriculum. 
they cook really well. They're really nice. Um, it's a different, it's a different uh, journey I'm on now. Uh, the, uh, through the Territory, through the Kimberleys, the, the youth suicide. Uh, I haven't yet sat with uh, any situation where there's not been domestic violence and sexual assault there um, in suicide attempts and youth suicides. And then when I dig deeper, I find the drugs here. So I want to kind of finish now by saying this to you. What a gift it is to be able to sit in this place at this time, in this little school here where all the kids have been booted out of other schools. Um, I will say, by the way, that I was talking to a bunch of magistrates and justices, uh, chief justices, and I asked them, is there a legal issue around that? Should children be in school? And they said, absolutely. There is a law in this country that every children has to be in, child has to be in school. So when they're suspended or expelled for, you know, 100 days and 200 days, somebody else is breaking the law. So I'm blessed. I'm really grateful to be learning from the children, listening to them, watching them, watching how excited they get when I see them out there with the teachers uh, doing basketball, watching how, how full of pride they are when they cook and take food home to their little siblings who haven't got anything to eat at home. I'm being serious when I say this. And blessed because they're challenging me. And they're challenging us to just lift our game a bit, to do it better. Sometimes um, I get invited to go and talk to um, big people in universities and uh, people in government. But what a privilege it is to sit and learn from children. I just want to say that and I want to thank you. And I'm really glad that everything kind of went crazy yesterday. It was a very hard day yesterday and I couldn't get my talk to you because actually I've um, not taken notes and I'm just speaking from my heart. Uh, that's where we need to be in our hard place as we work together. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. That's, uh, that's wonderful. Um, and, and the situation you're working in with, the, with the kids being kicked out of other schools, that's just so relevant, so important. Fantastic. And um, hopefully you can stay with us a little bit for the Q&A if possible. If not, we really appreciate that you've been able to join us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Judy. Um, we're just going to show you a short video now, which is um, which tries to capture in, um, I think, about eight minutes some of the work that we've been doing. And then after that, um, uh, Gunay Aghiva, uh, probably I pronounced it wrong, but she's going to talk to us a little bit about an evaluation that she's done um, at this family zone centre that we've established in Ingle Farm. Uh, she's a PhD student at the University of South Australia who explores Afghan refugee children's literacy experiences. Currently, she's working at a primary school providing literacy and numeracy support to newly arrived children. So she'll bring in the called aspect of, of what we do too. So, uh, Sarah, if you can get the, um, the video going and then Guno will speak to us. This is what Salisbury Communities for Children is committed to and what we're working towards. Communities where people are supported, empowered and resilient. Ultimately, our vision is for communities to become villages of people helping each other. Friends, families and neighbours equipped and empowered to support each other without always having to rely on a service. Most of the abilities and behaviours we have as adults get hardwired into our brains in the first thousand days or three years of our lives. What we experience in early childhood sets the pattern for the rest of our lives. This has huge implications. If we want to see transformation in communities at risk, it's so important that parents get all the support they possibly can in the first three years of their children's lives. While we want our communities to be like this, the reality is that we're not there yet. In 2005, the federal government recognised five suburbs in the Salisbury area as among 52 disadvantaged communities in Australia, and they supported C4C with funding to address the needs. We're now working across 13 suburbs in the area. We as parents, in particular, we as 
ourselves. The values and principles we hold guide and shape every decision we make and inform every aspect of what we do. The way that works is like this. If we have a principle of seeing workers as friends, then we're not going to set ourselves up as the experts who try and fix you and your problems. Instead, we'll come alongside you, get to know you and relate to you as a whole and capable person who needs a bit of extra support. Research has shown that a place-based approach is the most effective path to follow. Place-based approaches acknowledge the strengths and challenges of the community. By listening to what they want and need, we empower them to develop and own what we do together. From the outside, what we do might look like just another bunch of programs, but the secret source is the spaces we create to run the programs in. So instead of just creating individual programs and services that people come to, we create a space where people can come and hang out. Focusing on a welcoming and safe environment that's not time restrictive, so that people have the opportunity to drop in when it suits them. So I've grown up with family, but everyone's passed away. And I grew up with a sense of um, community and family, which my children now don't have. So this is more their lounge room that I can provide them that I otherwise can't give them. This creates a relaxed and trusting environment where people can sit and talk and relate to each other, peer to peer and individuals to volunteers or staff. In these relationships, new connections are made without the fear normally associated with attending the office of a service provider that people don't know. In this kind of space, we find that people often help each other as they share their own experiences and strategies. When I started here, I saw other parents, how they deal with the kids. So I learned so many things from them, like, you know, when they get crazy, how to deal with them, so which was very, very helpful to me. Through the relationships developed amongst community members and staff, people learn about other support that is available to them. So the challenge of going from one service to another with a new set of strangers and having to develop trust all over again is minimised through the relationships already developed. We have parents who are part of the Parents Next program who are then connecting into first steps. So it's not just this is the one thing that is going to solve your problems or it's going to help you, but if you can connect into different places, then if your needs are not being met here, then hopefully they're being met here or here. We can make a greater impact when we work closely with other services and integrate them together. We bring services to the people in the spaces we create where they feel safe. In this way, we're able to connect people with the supports that they need when they may not even be aware of other services or able to seek them out. This closes the gap that people can often fall through. And we can connect them into other services and other local services. I heard someone describe it last week actually as a web, if they you know, can be connected here but then connected into all these other areas as well, then you've got a greater support network. Finally, we believe the effectiveness of all of this comes down to having the right people. Staff who hold our values and who believe in the vision of what we are working towards. People who regard those we serve not as needy recipients, but as equal community members with their own unique qualities and strengths. We've got a lot of volunteers. Some of them here are actually parents that have had their children through the program and then they obviously believe in it and have loved it so much Then their children have gone off to school, they've come back to volunteer, which speaks volumes about how the, the program actually works and how encouraging and what a great environment it is for people. As we really believe in the holistic work of the Salvation Army. So everything from physical health, mental health, emotional health, spiritual health. So it's a, a good fit for us because we believe in the integrative model. And if we can support people, not just spiritually, but in other ways, then we think it's really beneficial for them and their, yeah, and their wellbeing. Oh, While everything we've talked about so far is real and transforming lives and communities, doesn't mean much outside of that community without the research to back it up. We think it's critical to know where we've started from and how far we've come and we believe in having measurable data that affirms the personal stories. So before we actually started any C4C programs or um, hubs in the area, uh, we had a look at what services were already here so that we could properly compare what was happening in our group and what was happening in other areas. 
UniSA had a look at our group of suburbs and had a look at child vulnerability levels and the general health of children and families in the area. And then they found a comparison group of suburbs that were really similar on levels of child vulnerability and that general overall health of children and families. And then they compared them again after a few years of us being here and we were able to see that Salisbury Communities for Children actually had made quite a positive impact in comparison to those similar suburbs. We're hearing from parents that they're noticing positive changes in their children, that they're noticing they've got better relationships with their children, kids are more confident and ready for school. Um, and then when we look at the actual data, we can see the exact same trends happening there as well. We continue to learn from what others are doing around the world and we bring that learning into our own specific context. And because we know that early childhood is the most valuable time to invest in a person's life, we want to learn from those who make that investment. We're also contributing to the conversation through conferences and the resources we publish. Since 2005, we've experienced just how much of a positive impact this place-based, people-led approach has had on individuals, families and whole communities. In this short amount of time, we've brought communities in crisis towards a healthier place. But we haven't reached sustainability yet. We've only just scratched the surface. There's so much more to be done and we see and are working towards the long-term vision of building resilient and empowered communities together. For me personally, Family Zone is the family that I don't have and a safe, supportive environment that you can always come to and count on. And without something like this, I don't know how my children would have a sense of community or family. It's vital to their understanding for their future, really. Okay, so Gune, you've had a look into what's happening there and uh, what have you found? Oh, hello everyone, yeah. I hope everyone can hear me now. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah, it was lovely to see, you know, how people are talking about Family Zone and it's great to see how families and children are supported and have access to these services provided by the communities. And I also learned about family zone through my PhD study at UniSA. So I was doing my PhD in, I started my doing my uh, PhD in 2016. Um, my supervisor, Associate Professor Elspeth McKings, recommended me to go and visit family zone to recruit families participants for my study. And then I came across, so, so that's why today I'm going to talk about family zone and specifically about Middle Eastern Women's Group, which is held in Family Zone for ladies from Middle, for ladies from middle Eastern countries. Oh. Next slide, please. Yeah, so my thesis is about, so the title of my thesis is Literacy Experiences of Emerging Bilingual Preschool Children from Afghan Refugee Families. And my study uh, was a qualitative case study, which included six participant families or six cases from Afghan cultural background. And, and I did my study under the supervision of Associate Professor C. Hill and Associate Professor Elspeth McKins. Next slide, please. So this group, uh, Middle Eastern Women's Group in the Family Zone. So when I visit the Family Zone, I heard that they have this group for these ladies who spoke Dari, Farsi, Arabic, Persian and English. When I first visited Family Zone, the staff was very friendly and I always felt welcome there. So when I entered the room where the ladies were sitting there and I felt like, you know, I entered a totally different world. Those beautiful ladies with their headscarves on, you know, home environment, children playing there kitchen just next door they, if someone is hungry they can get a cup of coffee or they can get food eat and talk and do different activities and one of the moms who was my participant family 
uh, she helped me. So she was working as a volunteer there and she helped me with interpreting and talking with other ladies there. Um, next, next slide, please. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> I also came across this study by McKinsey and Diamond about Family Zone Hub, which uh, was about, uh, so they did an evaluation project of the services offered by the by Family Zone Hub and Afghan ladies talked about this place and they talked, they reported about the benefits of attending the Family Zone and did they said for themselves, they said they felt safe there, they had access to social network, they learned about different services because they had, you know, information sessions were held there, learning new skills as parents, making friendships, and the most important thing was they didn't feel isolated or they, you know, they didn't feel depression, so they avoided depression risks. And then for their children, they said, you know, it was important that their children could get playtime, peer interactions and bilingual development, which is really interesting because I, I uh, found similar findings in my study with this family who regularly attended Family Zone. Next slide, please. So this girl, her name is Afshan. Well, that's a, that's a pseudonym. Uh, to protect her identity. She visited Family Zone every week with her mother and she was exposed to different play and literacy activities in the Family Zone. And when I visited Family Zone, I could see heaps of different range of literacy resources, books, toys for children, sandpit, play area, and, and of course, uh, and of course the staff who you know, lead those activities and uh, with these children. And they also had a big board where they could watch, you know, different uh, movies and cartoons in certain days. But also, most importantly, uh, they had that peer interaction so they could talk to other children. Well, with the, with the children who were from Afghan cultural background, they could talk in Persian. And, and then they even with, so with the children from Afghan background, they could even talk in English. So that was the same finding, which was about that, you know, that bilingual development, which uh, I came across in the study in the Nanivalation project by McKinsey and Diamond. Next slide, please. So this is the, another picture, which is from Family Zone and uh, these children are from Afghan families and then it's a Christmas time and then they're making some Christmas arts and crafts making doing uh, which was really important because uh, uh, when they uh, because I, I imagine uh, if they don't have access to these services they wouldn't be able to get that understanding about you know uh, making arts and crafts and during Christmas time, I realized it when I started to work at Salisbury North Primary School. When I was working in um, our intensive English language program with new arrived children, some of these children, when we asked them, you know, when it was playtime or making time, when we asked them to, to make something, some of these kids didn't know even how to hold scissors or when we asked them to make something, they had no idea what to do. Whereas these children had already that exposure to, to uh, you know, literacy resources, how to use recycling stuff to make different things, and the, and the cultural understanding. For example, these uh, families, when they were in the family zone, they were, <clears throat> they also had different events and activities, say cultural events, Eid, or after Ramadan, they were having those events and maybe Christmas and other Australian um, events. So, which means, uh, you know, these children were exposed to multicultural events, multicultural understanding, which developed their world knowledge. Uh, and then, which is really important, even when they start school, even research shows that, uh, for the comprehension, reading comprehension, it's important to you. When they read a book, if they don't know the cultural context behind that text, that will impact on their, read, in the, on their comprehension. 
So being exposed to these events and activities um, uh, had huge impact on these children's uh, literacy development, especially in their transitioning to school and starting school, um, like mainstream school. Uh, uh, the other thing was about developing bilingual, develop, uh, bilingual bilingualism, bilingual skills, and also having that peer interaction, because uh, in my study, some of the moms said, you know, when they came here, they were they couldn't see any children from the neighborhood neighborhood playing together. So if they had depression and they felt you know so sorry for their children that they brought their children to another country, then their ch child is at home all the time, having no one to play with, and all they did was sitting with technology, and having a lot of screen was a concern for the parents. So. But the family zone was a great place for this family, for Afshan, that she had that peer interaction and, you know, even with staff, with adults. So, and the mom really appreciated and was very grateful having this opportunity in the family zone. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, uh, one more important thing is about literacy. The resource that this family got from Family Zone. Uh, this family was in the pro process of, and a lot of the resources were packed in the boxes. So these were the ones that I could capture, uh, and there were more and more resources that uh, this family accessed from Family Zone. And the mom said, uh, every year, I think in the Family Zone, they put boxes with full of resources, free for families to take home and to use with their children. <clears throat> even when I asked if they had any books in Persian and she said yes she had one book in Persian and when I asked where did you access this book she said from Family Zone and it was interesting for me oh did you get a book from Family Zone in Persian not only in English but in other languages as well um, so yeah this family uh, was really grateful for having this opportunity and uh, to for their children uh, not only for Afshan, but her two, uh, she had two more children who were older than Afshan and they all sort of grew up in Family Zone. She always said, Family Zone was like a home for me. When it was, ra when it was raining outside, we were in, the, in Family Zone. When it was too hot outside, we were in Family Zone. So she said, it was a great place for my child to play with other kids and to spend quality time. Next slide, please. So this is a quote from, from the mum, uh, from the study, uh, to quote. and this is what she says, she says, from the time my first child was born in 2019, I'm coming here. I was walking one hour from home to here at that time I was not driving. It's very important, they play with the kids. They learn from each other using native language as well. It was also good for myself because I was communicating with other people, Afghan ladies. Now I'm a, I'm a volunteer here, so it's a very important place for me. Most of the time there is drawing, dancing, Play-Doh activities here. Uh, Afshan was waiting every Tuesday that I'm coming here and on Friday and Tuesday I was bringing her here for play, playgroup. She calls here my school. So it's really fascinating to see how this mom how plays, play, you know, Family Zone played a huge impact on this family's development because other five mothers that I have interviewed in my study, they all talked about depression, feeling isolated when they left their home country and they came here, that there was no one to talk to, they, there wasn't that social support. Whereas this mom, she was walking one hour. I talked about this in my study when I talked about, uh, you know, researchers' effects and emotions and I couldn't imagine how one, you know, how mum can walk one hour with a little child to one hour to family zone and then one hour back. Uh, so there could be, you know, so many challenges to cope with. So it was, I imagine how important family zone was for this, for Afshan's mum and for her children that she 
she wanted to walk one hour to the to families and, and then one hour back when she was not driving and now she's working as a volunteer there and then she said so these all these findings show how this place was important and then i also go back to the evaluation project done by McKinsey and Diamond and I see similar findings here, which was not only for her children, but also for herself, where she had that, you know, she also could communicate with other mothers. And then they were they were doing different activities. I, when, once when I visited families and I also saw there was a session, parenting session, they were learning so many different parenting skills there, which was really amazing because when you, when you are a new mom, when you grow up in your own country, well, your parents teach you how to be a good parent or you see them and then you copy them. Whereas if you get to a new country, it's, it's just a great opportunity for them to learn how to be a good mom, to learn those skills. Thank you. Thank you, Guno. That's fantastic. You could talk all day about this. <laughs> I can see that. Um, look, you, that's fantastic. Look, we, we, we're trying to get some questions in, so we want to take 10 minutes for questions and answers. So um, thank you. Um, can we, do we have some questions? Caroline um, Woodward has been monitoring the chat and um, we'll, sh we'll share some questions if we have them. So, um, yep, Caroline. Hi, Carl. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, so we didn't actually have any questions come through. Okay. Um, but you know, I think that we had a world of information from what we've experienced today. So, and I think, um, you know, there was a lot of thank you around um, the important points that Robert and Judy and probably even Gune have kind of made today around, you know, that, that safe and welcoming space and having the wisdom to have time to listen to people. And, um, you know, I think Robert's quote speaks it all. Uh, his, their, their future, it's their future, not ours. The future is theirs. Thanks, Caroline. Um, look, do we have any pressing questions um, straight off? We can probably take a couple of minutes. Um, it's good that you haven't put too many on the chat because we we have uh, we were trying to you know stick to time. And if anybody has any pressing questions for anybody, I'm not sure whether Judy is still with us, but. Yeah. Um, um, so, listen to her all day. <laughs> yeah. So, Carl, one did come up. Um, yep. So, it is. I wonder if there is work done to outreach to families that don't automatically want to be there. Yeah. Who would like to respond to that? Families who don't automatically want to be there. Um, so, that is um, that is a big question about. I mean, the whole concept of building a place that is is family friendly. Um, that is non-stigmatizing, um, people don't feel like they're going to be, you know, bailed up into the child protection system as soon as they walk in the door. Um, Judy, do you want to comment on that? There's two parts of that. First of all, the grannies and the um, older women who are looking after the children just accept any help they can get. More particularly, I'm choosing to work, I'm choosing to work here in this school because under law, Every child has to be in school, and if the school is failing the children, then the schools have to look at that. But in the meantime, we're the ones that are here picking up the pieces when the children are expelled or suspended from those schools. What we're finding is that there is a lack of uh, of there's a lack of competency and also theory around the children's behaviour. So we have and I say this with all due respect, an unskilled workforce sometimes. And it's amazing how parents in crisis, in distress, can feel that their children um, are not welcome, that their children are being judged. So we've got a, a, a very big responsibility to see these children as teaching us something about this country, about ourselves. Um, yeah, that we've had um, children who will walk a long way to come to school because they know they're going to get a feed here. They know they're safe here. Um, and certainly, you know, I did not expect to learn as much as I am learning from those children. So I'm going to say again, um, I'm, uh, choosing to work in a school means that I understand that in this country, there are laws that say all children have to be in 
school and then there's some education institutions who are breaking those laws and kicking kids out of school because they don't understand their behaviour. So I'm blessed to be here in this place and, um, and learning you know, from everything that's happening, including, I just want to say and then I'll finish, um, going down to the kitchen where the children are having cooking lessons and they can cook beautifully and they are so full of pride when they take that food home to feed their little um, under school age siblings. Uh, so they care, these, these children in crisis themselves care for and want to help um, their siblings. So I want to make sure their siblings get something to eat as well. So it's yeah. a process yeah. that's, that's, I think our society that's um, struggling really badly. Yeah. Um, I don't know any, I mean, there will be kids who walk from school when they're in crisis, um, but they'll come back. And the grandparents and the aunties who are responsible for the kids are really grateful for them to be here. Mm. Yeah, food is really important, so important. Having the kitchen, place, um, being able to gather around that kitchen, and also what you say about schools is so critical too, because you know every child has to be in school. Every family can potentially be engaged through a school who may not engage with with other services. And so that's where they feel safe. Yeah, yeah, feeling safe. Yeah. Carl, it's yes. here. Yeah, I wonder if I can follow up on that question about um, uh, those who are not connected to the program, um, particularly as it relates to schools. Just wondering how your programs reach out to draw people into the program. Um, I assume they don't just happen to accidentally uh, turn up on your doorstep. Um, I, I know with the problems with schools, because I spent many years doing talks for parents in schools, only at the end of the talk, having the principal or the teacher come up to me and say, unfortunately, the parents we wanted you to talk to haven't come. And the question of how you attract the people who really need the services is one that I think we need to wrestle with. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll hear some more about that, I guess, but um, really, yeah, engaging people. I mean, one of the things that we try to incorporate into what we do is, is home visiting and just going out to people's homes. A lot of people come because friends suggest this is a welcoming place and you, sh you need to come. So that personal invitation. Uh, we've also found that, you know, people find out information via the internet too. So that the whole online, presence is important. And another thing we found also that one of our social emotional programs in schools, uh, we found that the kids are actually learning um, to be cared for and to care for each other. Kids who've been traumatised were being cared for by kids who perhaps had a better start. And um, when we had a parents evening, uh, we found all the parents at a school, normally where you get two or three parents come, uh, about 30 came out of a class. So it was, it was just amazing that kind of response when they actually saw what the children were learning and they took that home. And then um, the parents said, well, wow, what, what's my child learning? She asked me how I was feeling today, you know? And so that, that was another um, really key, key area. Thanks, Glenn, for that. Um, look, um, it's probably time to go into our deep dive sessions. I don't know whether we've got one more question um, quickly. Um, so we don't actually have any more questions. I guess okay. there's just a couple of perspectives around um, schools aren't always a positive place for some families um, mm. due to their past experiences and just um, the lovely idea around place-based instead of service-based um, puts a beautiful emphasis for families that changes a platform for them. Um, yeah. And just, yeah, a wealth of knowledge. Thank you. Yeah. Can I say one more thing before I go? Yes, Judy. The, the school principal here invited me out here in 2011 and I've been coming back and forward. So I get here and she says, let's go for a drive. And we go down to the places where you don't, don't normally drive down because they're considered to be unsafe places. And the kids are out on the street and there's, there's 200 houses that have been burnt down here. So that's what it looks like. And she'll drive slowly and, and then one of the, the children will see her, one of the young people will see her and come running over, Animagi, Animagi. And she'll stop and she'll have a talk. And, um, and, and that's my phone, I'll just lock it up. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. 
<laughs> Technology, it's, it's good and it's not good sometimes. And she'll, and she'll just uh, sit quietly and talk to them for a while. And, and I was with her in the car the day before yesterday and a young fella came over, he's about 14, and he was stoned out of his mind. And she said, oh, you know, look, and I'll call him Bill because that's my dad's name. Oh, Billy, you know, we really missed you, you know. You're such a fabulous young fella. You're so bright, you know. We've missed you at school, you know. And if you don't come to school in the next day or so, they're going to be after you. You know, because he, he had he'd been away for a while and he was one of the kids from the families that parents had been taken away. He turned up the next day. He turned up. And we were so grateful to see him come into that yard. Um, so it's like follow up. It's not like expecting them to come to us. It's us going and having a yarn with them and maybe taking a, a, a takeaway just because we know some of those kids are going to be hungry or just kind of pulling up and sitting and, and talking to a, a group of kids sitting in the gutter. And, and she knows them all. This principal knows them all by name, knows their families. And it's follow up, follow up all the time. I want to make that point. It gets in the car. Mm. Yeah. How to do it. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic, Judy. Your input has been wonderful. Um, and we'll, we'll be picking up on this next week as we look at some of these specific uh, communities that we can develop to support families better. Um, we're going to now go into deep dive sessions. Those of you who want to do the deep dives um, can, can join those sessions. And Sarah is probably frantically trying to fit you into different groups. Um, we've got um, five groups. The first one is um, led by Dr. Jenny Stanley, uh, who's the Social Inclusion Coordinator for Good Start in South Australia, and it's on the early learning um, communities and child care. And um, we've got another one on playgroups, which uh, Craig Bradbrook, who's the Chief Executive of Playgroups SA, is leading. And we have another one on schools, um, junior primary schools. James Lenigas is the general manager of Wellbeing and Education for Schools Ministry Group. He'll be leading that group. And another one we have on um, faith communities, which Dr. Glenn Cupid, who you saw just a minute ago, uh, he'll be leading that. And he's, uh, his PhD was actually on children's spiritual development in secular education. So um, a challenging area. And um, that, that's, that will be an interesting group to do as well. And the, the final one is um, children and family centres, and that's the one most of you in, indicated you'd like to be involved with. And so we've actually asked Geraldine Harris, who is one of our keynote presenters for the last session, um, and she's had experience in Shore Start in England um, and Communities for Children in Australia, and uh, has just done, is doing her PhD thesis actually on leadership, um, developing leadership um, for community uh, initiatives like um, communities for children and other similar initiatives. So um, you're welcome to join one of those groups. Um, if, if you're not doing that, um, we uh, look forward to having you back again next week at the same time and uh, keep the conversations going. Um, and if you use Twitter, not many of you do, keep the conversation going there. Um, look at the pre-reading and the pre-listening and um, we just look forward to you thinking also about what you can do in your local community and coming up with a plan that will make a difference for children across this land at a time we so desperately need it. So thank you, everybody. Um, it's been fantastic to, to have you, and uh, we look forward to continuing next week.